and its title, translated into English, is The Girl with the Flaxen Hair. His name was Ernest Alexander Nicol, a passionate pianist and a pioneering surgeon. As war broke out, coal was desperately needed to fuel the fight against the Nazis. At one point, Britain almost ran out of supplies. My grandfather, then in his late 30s, began helping some of the tens of thousands of miners on the home front, injured underground. At the National Coal Mining Museum in Yorkshire, you can still experience what life was like in the war years. It was a dangerous job. Hello, what's your name? I think what is, really strikes me coming down here is how people manage to cope coming in here day after day, working in these conditions, and the threat, the permanent threat of, of being injured, of being killed. Yeah, it became a way of life for the miners. You know, they, they were sort of brought up in mining families and generation after generation would be working in the mines. So it was sort of in the blood. This is where the miners uh, would work, they'd drive the machine and they'd drill and blast the coal face and shovel it all onto this conveyor. Unbelievable! There were terrible accidents, there were oh. blasts going off, the wood yes, was creaking. Yes. It'd be mainly broken limbs and, and broken backs and these all came from getting buried under rock falls. And once they had a, an injury as bad as a, as a broken back, the chances of them getting back to work were quite slim. Yes, it'd be very slim. To, they certainly wouldn't be coming back down the mine working in, in these conditions. Mm. My grandfather lived in the heart of mining communities in Nottinghamshire where he worked as a surgeon. He decided to use his skills to help miners get back to work. And this is Berry Hill Hall, a country home that in 1939 my grandfather transformed into the first rehabilitation centre for injured miners. It was pioneering the work that he led here. And by the end of World War II, there were six more centres, just like this one, that had opened up in mining communities across the north of England. Then a plaster case is applied to prevent any movement in the And here he is, spine, filmed during the war for a government video to highlight his work. He focused on building up muscle strength after injury, with up to three hours a day in a specially built gym and occupational therapy. 95% of his patients went back down the mines. Berry Hill Hall is very, very important. It had that crucial kind of role in providing that rehabilitation service then to this large group of industrial workers who were at risk of these kinds of injuries and these impairments and disabilities. Uh, so it, it does play an important role then in getting very large numbers of such injured workers to a level of fitness where they can return to work. That's me. 93-year-old Harry Parks was forced down the mines as a teenager. Boots, he thought he was going to issued. war. Instead, like almost 50,000 men, he was conscripted as a Bevan boy, as they were known. I hated every day of going to the pit. To start with, I was frightened to death because we knew, uh, being in a mining area, that uh, I think it's, uh, it was a 1,000 men killed every year working in a coal mine. But if we didn't go, we, it was on pain of imprisonment. Because I was a conscript, I felt that I, was I should be fighting for my country. Um, um, I wasn't allowed to do that. Ernest Bevin was speaking out for the British people. The Bevin boys were named after the wartime Minister of Labour, Ernest Bevin, who had been charged with increasing Britain's coal production. He decided that a tenth of the young men who'd signed up to go to war would instead go down the mines to replace those who were fighting abroad. The number of serious accidents increased as pressure grew on the mines to extract more and more coal. And for the thousands of 18 to 24 year olds who thought they were heading for the front line, it was a huge shock to find themselves underground. It was done on a ballot system, so um, they had the numbers 0 to 9 in a hat and Bevin's secretary picked out a number randomly every fortnight and if your registration ended with that number you were conscripted to the mines. So you had men who would have been training to go into the Air Corps or to the Air Force and they ended up being conscripted to work underground. Well, we never had a uniform. We had to buy our own gear, clothes and boots and helmets uh, when we worked at the pit, you, you were going into 
whatever the danger was, you had to do it. You were a conscript. And so you did what you were told. This is a nerve injury. Miners were five times more likely to have an accident than other workers on the home front. My grandfather treated more than a thousand a year at the local hospital. Where did you go that he worked? My mother was a young child but vividly remembers going to work with him. We went to Berry Hill Hall and I can remember it had a lovely big lawn. I don't think I ever went inside the building. I was only about six or seven, it was a very long time ago, but we used to play on the lawn. That's where all the exercises took place, I think. He also took her to his fracture clinic on hospital visits. Every Saturday morning we went to Mansfield General Hospital to do a ward round and he would put on his white coat and um, we'd sweep in and he was made such a fuss of and then we went uh, all, all round uh, all the patients chatting to each one. After the war, Ernest Nicol carried on his work with miners. He spent the rest of his life working as an orthopaedic surgeon in the NHS and playing the piano, a showman to the very end.